by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. I want to please God. I'd rather please God and displease all others than to please all others and displease God. Can I get a witness? By faith, they passed through. Can I tell you, we're just passing through. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Whereas the Egyptians attempting to do the same thing were drowned. Most gracious Heavenly Father, what an honor and privilege it is to pastor. What I believe to be the greatest people. And Lord, I thank you today, God, all those that came out to worship you. Now, Lord, I need some help today. And Lord, if you don't anoint my lips, Lord, then my words will fall short. But Lord, if you anoint me to preach like a man from another world, this world's wisdom is fading away. Lord, if you anoint me today, God, then your words will bring life and faith and encouragement and direction as we pass through this life. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. You might be seated. Thank you for being here on this Lord's Day, the final day of 2023. Godly faith. Having faith means to believe, obey, and trust. Now, you have heard, as well as I have heard, many people say that they have faith. And yet, they never fully obey God. Others say they have faith but never completely trust God. And then there's some that say they have faith in God, but they never actually believe the Word of God. Believing, obeying, and trusting. Now, these will be tested and tried. In fact, if faith were a cake, I don't like cake, preacher. Well, if faith was a cookie, and if you don't like a cookie, well, I, I, I don't have any hope for you. If faith were a cake, I like cake, chocolate cake. I don't like a dry cake. I like a cake moist. That's why you put the extra stick of butter in it. And I know a lot of people don't like this. This must be the Duke's mayonnaise people. I don't like the whipped icing. I like the good old icing that's made of lard. 100% sugar. So if I were baking a faith cake today, it would be chocolate with old school lard icing, extra stick of butter. I've already made myself sick. So if faith were a cake, the ingredients to bake a faith cake would first you would have to believe and then you got to obey and then you got to trust. And if you leave out an ingredient, what you want to make won't turn out like you thought it should. And so today we say that we are Christians, that, that we are a people of faith and so faith is made up in believing, obeying, and trusting. That's what should make up our faith in God. And if we're lacking any one of the three, then we fall short and faith begins to wane. See, when we believe God is who He says He is, then we will worship Him. When we obey God, then we will labor for Him. Did you know sometimes coming to the house of God is a labor? Sometimes praying and calling out to God at that 9 p.m. or midnight hour is a labor. Sometimes you have to labor in the Word. Sometimes you've got to labor witnessing. So if we have faith, then we will obey. We will la if you have faith, you'll trust God. What does that mean to trust God? It means you'll walk with Him. We see this in the lives of Abel and Enoch and Noah. We've preached on that thought. Worshiping faith, working faith, and walking faith. 
We also see these three elements if we were baking a cake today. The ingredients of a faith cake, believing, obeying, trusting. We see this in the life of Abraham, called out of the land of Ur and the land of the Chaldeans. In fact, if you were to take time today and read the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, you would find many that have these three ingredients and they're full of faith. In fact, that's why we have Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. It's recorded in all of history as an example for you and I to be encouraged and an example to follow. And the writer of Hebrews on this day, the last day of 2023, is telling you and I that it's by faith that we are able to pass through. And the only way that we can have the faith that gives us the ability to pass through this world and through trials and tribulations and and a culture that has gone mad and politics that are corrupt and a society that is beside itself and saturated with sin, the only way that we'll be able to pass through is you have to have these faith ingredients. We see it the life of the Israelites. As we read, they passed through by faith on dry ground. They made it. I want to make it. I said, I want to make it. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. I want to make it. So the Israelites had to first believe God. That God was able. That God loved them and cared for them. That God was indeed who He said He was. That He was righteous and sovereign and holy. and That He was a protector and a provider and a promise keeper. I want to tell you today, no matter where you are in life, God is able. God cares for you. The world may not. But God cares for you. You may feel unloved by the world. God loves you in that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish. God loved you enough that when He formed you, He made you in His very image. God loves you. He's still righteous and sovereign. Then the Israelites had to obey. They had to do what God asked. Now it's human nature to push against them. But if we have faith in God, not only do we have to believe God, we have to obey God. We have to do what He says. We have to do what He commands. Why? Because He knows more than we do. He he has already been where we want to go. He told the Israelites, you need to get ready. You need to get all the leaven out of the house. You need to kill a lamb. You need to eat with your shoes on. You need to have your bags packed. You need to be ready to go. Don't let nothing hinder you because... In a moment, the death angel is going to pass by and they're going to release you from Egypt and have some blood sprinkled on the doorpost. Obedience. Like us, obedience, oftentimes we don't feel like it. We don't want to. It's hard to do. We can't seem to find anybody else obeying. Yet God still requires obedience. And it's better than any sacrifice. And then lastly, you've got to trust in God. You got to put your faith. In other words, you got to go without knowing. You got to do without seeing. You got to walk with God. You got to go where God says. You got to move when God moves. You got to walk with Him. You got to be led by Him. Now, the Red the Red Sea crossing is the most pivotal moment in Israel's history. They still talk about it today. It's one event in Israel's history that's referred to over and... Have you had an event in your life that you can pinpoint it was a turning point in your history? That was the Red Sea crossing. In fact, all throughout Scripture, minor prophets, major prophets, poets and shepherds and kings... They talked about it when you arrive at the New Testament. Jesus talked about it. The epistle writers talked about it. The revelator in John talks about it. And every believer, every Christian, anyone who says they have faith in God, you need to have a Red Sea moment. It's a moment where we, each one, must decide for themselves, am I going to go back from where I came from? 
Or am I going to stay right here where I'm at? Or am I going to cross through? Am I going to pass through? Am I going to make it to the other side? It's a moment that one must decide, do I really believe God? Will I obey and can I trust Him? We all have one of those elements that we struggle with. Some find it easy to believe that God is. Others find it easy to just obey. Others find it easy to trust, but seldom do we find one that easily does all three. Do we have faith to pass through? See, here at the Red Sea crossing, the most pivotal moment in Israel's history, it looked bleak. It looked scary. It looked uncertain, just like society looks like today. We can describe the Red Sea moment in Exodus 14. Did you read it? We can describe that Red Sea moment as a moment without solution. Have you ever been there? You were standing at a circumstance. You were facing a crisis. You received some news. Your heart got broke, the finances were out of order and the child didn't behave and there was chaos and you were at a moment in your life and you said, I don't have a solution. Have you ever been there? That's where they were. They were without answer. They had no way out. And every Christian, do we have any Christians in the house today? Every Christian, if you're not, you can be. You should be. I want you to be. God may draw you today if you don't know him. But every Christian needs a Red Sea moment. And you'll find you'll have more than one in life. Where there is no way out. It's a situation of no escape. And only an undeniable, unmistakable act of God will get you out. The Israelites, their freedom and their way of lives, now all but lost. Imagine the picture. Here is the entire nation. Historians tell us approximately 2 million people. The Bible numbers the man. And so if every man had a wife and a child or two, Easily it would ex exceed 2 million people. So here's 2 million people that have just, they had only known bondage. They had never stepped foot out of Egypt. They didn't know anything about the outside world. All they knew was whips on their back, making bricks and mortar, building up a city. That's all they knew. They knew nothing else. They were born into it. It was their life. And so here is a nation of two million people after ten signs and wonders and plagues where God overthrew Egypt and rendered them helpless. Now they were free and they're leaving and given their first taste of freedom. Victory. Only now to find just a couple of days later to find themselves at a dead end. Facing the Red Sea, the enemy is closing in. There's no escape, no way out. They look to the left and to the right, and the mountains of terror and the sounds of night are filling the air. There was nothing to save them except a supernatural act of God. I still believe that we serve a supernatural, miracle-working, promise-keeper, Red Sea parting, uh, Lazarus awaking God. Here they are, no way out. The Red Sea in front, Pharaoh coming behind, surrounded by the mountains, no way out. What a frightening, scary place to be. It is here that one must decide, am I going to go back? Am I going to surrender? Am I going to fight? Am I going to... Try to make it work here where I'm at. And God is telling them and He's telling us today on this last day, we must press forward. 
Consider the Israelites at this moment in history. Unlike us, they didn't have a Bible to read. The Israelites, all they had ever known was slavery and bondage and brutality. Everything now was foreign to them. The terrain, the weather, everything was strange. You know? and, and they didn't foresee or anticipate the Red Sea splitting and drying up. They could not imagine the mighty army of Pharaoh and the Egyptian army who were coming at full rage, vengeance. Approaching at breakneck speed. They could not imagine that suddenly they would be stopped or swallowed up in defeat. So they were afraid. If we were truly transparent, if our thoughts and emotions were played on the screen as the lyrics were this morning, all of us have things that we are afraid of. It could be the future. It could be a doctor's it could be the job. It could be the child. There's many things that we are afraid of. They were afraid. And suddenly the Israelites saw and felt like this was it. This is the end. We were brought out here to experience victory only for a moment to be swallowed up in defeat. And they were despaired. And suddenly disappointment began to settle in the heart. And I believe that they began to succumb to the feelings of let's just die. Let's just die or let's just give up. We can't fight. We don't have any weapons. And they had yet to learn to trust God. Probably the most overlooked part of this pivotal story, this true account of the Israelites is this fact. God put them in that position. God did it. And God didn't ask them if they wanted it or if they liked it. God put them in this position to be facing a Red Sea, to be surrounded by mountains, and for the enemy to be coming in from behind. They were surrounded on every side, and God did it to them because God had a plan, and He did it on purpose. See, to Israel, see, Israelites were not seafaring people. In fact, in ancient times, Israel was terrified of the ocean. They seen the ocean as death. Pharaoh represented the devil. And Egypt was sin and bondage. And the mountains that they saw represented the terror and the fright and the fears of the world. And God had brought them to this place. Could it be that on this last day of 2023 that the place that you are at, the place that you have found yourself in, that if you stopped and listened, you might be able to hear the enemy pursuing. You might be able to feel and see the terror of the world. You can't see it, but it looks like it might be the end. Has anybody ever been there? You might be here right now. God I thought you were a loving, compassionate God. Why, God, would you allow your people and even us today to arrive at a point that looked unescapable? I've learned this in living 55 years. Faith that's never tested can't be trusted. Note takers, write that down. A faith that's never been tested can't be trusted. It's like getting a child to, to jump into the swimming pool the first time. 18 months, 2 years old. I'm in the pool. Jump, Luke. No, Daddy. Jump, Luke. No, Daddy. Come on, Luke, I'll catch you. Why? He was afraid. Why was he afraid? Because what I was asking had never been tested he couldn't trust it so after some coaxing and bribing and moving up to the shallow end luke jumped in called him that might have been the biggest mistake of my life because until that boy left home he was always trying to jump on me why trusted me 
So a faith that's never been tested can't be trusted. So could it be that God has brought you and I to a place in life where it feels like the enemy is just right there behind us There's no escape to the world and it looks like we can't pass through. Could it be that God has brought you to this moment so your faith can be tested so that then He could be trusted? That that was a good place to say amen, shout hallelujah right there. See, we must learn from experiencing our own Red Sea moment that God is the God of the impossibility. He's the God of miracles and the miraculous. That God can make a way when there isn't any other way. That God can do what nobody else can do. And I've learned this, God does His best work when I'm in my nighttime. Not asleep, but in spiritual darkness. See, when Christians face their own Red Sea, and it can take many different forms, we must in that moment learn to look up Look up from whence cometh my strength. Look up your redemption draweth nigh. Look up and see the salvation. It's in those Red Sea moments that our faith is getting ready to be tested. Real faith. That believing, that obeying, that trusting faith. Those ingredients as if you were making a faith cake. They have to be tested. They have to be tried so that then you can trust it. See God wants us to trust Him by believing and obeying and looking to Him. And in those moments, we must learn to look upward. We must learn not to look back, not look to the left, not look to the right. It's amazing how many plans people have. I was asked recently, you're going to retire? I don't have a plan to. Well, preacher, that ain't good sense. I mean, you know, you need to retire. I can't find it in the Bible where preachers retire. I can't find it. Hey, no offense if people retire, but that's not on my plan. Now, I could, I, could, I could become sick. I could be rendered, I could lose my voice. But it's amazing that society offers so many different plans, and it causes us to then say, well, God, I'm going to do all this other stuff first. I'm going to try this first, and then if they all fail, and then I'll look to you. And so God will bring us to a moment that all of our means have been exhausted. All of our choices has been expired. God will bring us to a moment that the enemy is in hot pursuit and the terror of the world is on either side and the place that we need to go we can't get through because the sea's in the way and God will bring us there so that our faith can be tested so then it can be trusted and we'll begin to look up and learn that God is a miracle working way making promise keeping God that's who he is see we spend much of our time looking back or looking around even looking ahead for answers for a way out The whole nation's already looking to next November. And they say that'll be the solution. That'll be that. No, it won't. We look for other jobs and more money and titles and we think if we get this possession or or this house, why in themselves they are not wrong. They are not the answer. See, God simply says, I want you to look up. I found that when you're looking up, you miss a lot of the stuff down here that's going on that'll get you sidetracked. I am talking spiritually. When you drive, you better focus on the road. It's in our own Red Sea moment where you and I decide with the determination, no matter what, I'm not going back there. And with that same determination, we say, I'm not going to try to work it out here where I'm at. I've got to press. It's amazing, the Egyptian army coming at full force, full of vengeance and rage, and they thought, we've got them trapped now. Then God places a pillar of fire between his people and the enemy. See, God knew in advance that the nation would be put in this situation. 
God knew that he would put them in this situation so that they would begin to call out to him, and they did. And God was about to show himself strong. Why does God need to do that? Because we often forget how big God is. See, we're standing at our problem and we say, that's big. Oh, it's bigger than anything. But if we'd back up a little bit and we'd begin to look up, we'd begin to see God is bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any crisis. He's bigger than any doctor's report. He's bigger than any bankruptcy. He's bigger than any divorce. He's bigger than any problem, any drug addiction. God is bigger than any politician. He's bigger than any war. God is about to show Himself strong. And that's the God we need to see. And we'll only see it when we arrive at our Red Sea moment and there's no way out. So in Exodus 14, we find the Israelites had several choices. We got too many choices today. We got too many choices. I mean, just walk down the vegetable aisle. Have you ever seen so many cans of beans and corn, rice and yams? You go down the frozen food aisle and there's 38 doors of ice cream. And you go. Too many choices. But there's only one right choice. Many on that day in Exodus 14 simply wanted to just go back. Go back to what they knew. They had rather be enslaved and have their provision given for them than to be free and trust God for every provision. The devil had rather bind you and provide for you. God wants you to be free and you trust Him to make provision for you. Others decided there on that day, Exodus 14, some believed that they could make it work right where they were. God, after all, had put a pillar of fire behind them, and well, the mountains were there and the sea, and so they said, let's just set up camp right here. We can make it. Could it be that even right now in this moment, God has you, has me, has us in a Red Sea moment? See, we're coming to the close of another year. And for some of us, we have more years behind us than we have ahead of us. Others, you've stacked just enough yesteryears up, it's a place you'd like to go back and live. Because the future looks bleak and the present moment sure ain't what you expected. After all, the Israelites, after leaving Egypt in a great victory, never expected to end up here, especially after all the signs and the wonders. You see, you and I, we know the past. We were there. We know the good and the bad, the sad, the glad times. We know the easy and difficult times. It's much easier to look back there. It's much easier. Oh, I should have done that. I wish I had done that. I'm glad I did. It's easy to live in the past. Did you know the past is taught more than the future or the present? I mean, we just had the Christmas season. I went to my mother-in-law's house, loved my mother. We spent time with my dad. You know what the conversation was at both places? The past. That was the conversation. It was the past. Because the past is what we know. Good or bad, we've gotten comfortable. See, the past is now clear. It's, the present day is cloudy and the future is uncertain. So it's easy to just live back there. That's why parents try to keep their children children. That's why the media, all they do is talk about what was. No solutions for what is and no hope for what might be. Many wrestle their whole lives with this voice. Come back here. One more drink. One more look. One more smoke. Let's step out one more time. 
Nobody, the past is always calling like the Egyptian army and the pharaohs. Come back and we'll provide for you. Oh, you'll be bound, you'll be enslaved, but we'll give you what you need. Others decided to just stay where they are. You can see the enemy, you can feel him, but you've also experienced the fire of God. Those that say, well, I'm not going to live back there, but there's many today that just live right here. And you can see the enemy. You can feel him, you can hear him. You might even have a conversation. But you also look back and see the fire of God, that moment in your life, and and you've decided just to set up camp right where you are, content to stay where you're at. It's like this. You have enough of God, but you don't want any more of God. You're at a little distance from the enemy, but you haven't been delivered from the enemy. Just going to stay right where you are. You're going to do no more, do no less. And you're struggling. You're fighting. There's no peace. And there's no rest. And you resolve just to stay where you are spiritually. And it's become complacent and content. And, but like Israel, God is calling us to move, to, to forge, to, to press. Ahead. Paul said, I'm going to run this race. Don't slack up. Don't fall behind. I tell you, the older we get, the deeper we're into history. We ought to move forward at a faster pace, a more dedicated race. But Israel said, Lord, we can't move forward. The Red Sea, we're going to drown. Pharaoh's going to catch us. The sea is too deep, it's too wide, it's too far. We're weak, we don't have any weapons, we're afraid. What do we do? Can I tell you the very thing that God is calling you to do will be the very thing that He delivers you with? The very thing, thing that God is calling you to walk through that you're resisting may be the very thing that God uses to bless you, prosper you, promote you, deliver you. See, the command in Exodus 14 was to move forward well before the sea ever parted. Move ahead. It was through the Red Sea that God delivered Israel because of faith, believing, obeying, trusting. And Israel walked through the Red Sea as on dry ground. They left the past. They said, we're not, we're not going to settle here. By faith, they walked through the sea on dry ground. Guess what happened? Their enemy, thinking they could do the same, was destroyed. So in one pivotal moment in history, I'm coming to a close. One was delivered and one was destroyed. One prospered and one perished. What can we learn from this? Pivotal moment, Exodus 14, on this last day of 2023. I've found this to be true. Those that live in the past spend most of their time grumbling and complaining about everything else. And when we decide, and it's easy to decide just to stay right here where we are. We find ourselves complacent, comfortable. We also find ourselves easily frightened. I've never seen the church worry like it does today. So full of worry. Why? Because the church has decided we're just going to stay. I'm not talking about connection. I'm talking about the church in America. We're not going to live in the past, but we're just going to stay right here where we are. And so suddenly everything frightens us. Jobs, families. The Red Sea crossing shows us a picture of salvation and sanctification. It's a symbol of baptism. It shows us that the old is gone and the new has come. There's a new way to live. There's new life, new path. And we can learn that God is indeed trustworthy. He is faithful. He knows what He's doing. And this account, this account teaches us that when we reach an obstacle, it's just an opportunity for God to show Himself strong. When we truly place our faith in God, when we believe, when we obey, when we, we trust, we will see that God will work on our behalf for His good and ours. And God will stand between us and the enemy. As you stand today, I want to challenge you with some things. First of all, I want you to, challenge, to be challenged. Yes, we have the past to learn from. We have this present moment that we have to live in physically. 
We got life and bills and family and stuff. Yes. I want to issue a challenge to you today. God is calling you and I, the church, to forge ahead, to press on, to fight the good fight of faith. Now, we can learn from our past, absolutely. But I don't want to live that way. I don't want to settle for who we are. You see that empty seat beside you? I want you to fill it this year. I want us to be averaging 100 people by the end of this year. But you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. I want to issue another challenge as we press forward. See, see that, that means you got to press forward. Because right now it looks impossible. Oh man, the culture in Asheville. I've talked, I hear people, well, I, I don't have anybody to witness to. I don't have anybody to invite to church. Baloney. Baloney. If I could spell it, I would, but I'd probably misspell it. Baloney. I don't know anybody. Baloney. I'm cha- God, is, God has issued a challenge in His Word today. He said, The harvest is light. Labors. I want to challenge you today to not be complacent. I want to challenge you today as the music begins to play softly. For those that only attend sometime, God is saying, I need you to attend all the time. We're not talking about vacation, sickness. We understand that some can't drive at night, of course. But we have many that we just see on Sunday or, or maybe two Sundays a month. If we continue that rain, then... We're going to become complacent. God is saying, I, God's calling a family meeting a couple times a week. I want you to be here. God has issued a challenge today for those that, that only read a little. God's saying, I need you to read a lot. The very thing that you do, I'll deliver you with. For those that, for those that don't tithe, God said, try me. Test me. See if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that's not room to contain. Press down, shaking together, running over. For those that you just consume, God is saying, I need you to be a contributor. For those that have heavy hands, anybody got heavy hands? You, you weak? Uh, we, we're going we're gonna to test this right now. Anybody got heavy hands? You, you're tired. See, God is issuing a challenge through His Word today. He's saying, take those heavy, wore-out, beat-down hands and raise them up to heaven. Somebody, come on. Raise up them heavy hands. Oh, it's a sign of surrender. The challenge is being issued today to press forward. It doesn't look like we can do it. It doesn't look like we can make it. We got the world that's terrorizing. We got the enemy that's calling us to come back. God is issuing a challenge today saying don't be silent anymore. Start telling the good news. Start being a witness. Start worshiping and praising. And the very thing that God is calling you to pass through, pass through reading, pass through attending, pass through witnessing, pass through worshiping, pass through giving. You can do it. That will be the very thing that God takes and says, I'm going to deliver you and I'm going to take out your enemy. That was the chance to shout right there. Hey, some of you is wrestling with heartbreak. Some of you is wrestling with a financial crisis that you go, I'm not making it. Some, a problem has showed up at home. Well, you've got to have faith to pass through. And in that passing through, you've got to do what you've never done. You've got to go where you've never been. And when you do that, God will take that very thing and he will deliver you and he'll destroy your enemy. I wonder if anybody accept the challenge today. If there's someone here that doesn't know the Lord, if there's someone here that you've walked out on the Lord, today is the day to come home and say, Lord, I accept the challenge. I'm making you my Lord and Savior. I confess with my mouth. I believe that you are Lord. I repent. I turn from this life I'm living. If anybody would accept that challenge today, would you walk down to this altar? You're watching online today. Make an altar where you are. Get up off the couch. Get on your knees. 
stand in the corner, whatever you need to do, would anybody accept the challenge and say, you know what, I'm not going back. I'm going to learn from the past. I'm not complacent here spiritually. I want more God. I want more of the Holy Ghost. I want more word and power. I want more power. Then you got to do what you've never done. you got to go where you've never been. And the very thing that God is calling you to pass through with, he will deliver you and he will destroy your enemy. Anybody else accept the challenge? I accept the challenge. I'm proclaiming, this is Stan Asher, I'm proclaiming this year the year of the word. I'm, I'm putting you on notice. I'm going to start texting people. I'm going to start saying, where are you reading that? Where are you reading that? Hey, where are you at in God? Where are you reading that? I appreciate those that responded back and had conversation with me yesterday. Hey, you can ask me, where are you reading that? And if it takes me a minute to answer, you better get on me. And hey, you better be the preacher. What's wrong with you? Hey, we got to walk this race together, don't we? We got to go hand in hand. That way, if, if somebody stumbles, hey, we'll be there to pick you up, right? Hello? Somebody stumbles. Let's, let's stay together. Let's stay together. Hey, I think this might be a good year in the house of God. Father, I want to ask you now to bless your people. God, we've come through one year that's been full of heartbreak and tragedy and, and trouble and, and depression, God. It's been a financial burden from the gas station to the grocery store to the light bill to the insurance company, Lord. So, Lord, I pray, God, Lord, you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you. Lord, faith pleases you. And you said it's your good pleasure to give to your children. So, Lord, I pray as we leave one year, step into a new year, Lord, that we have faith to pass through, that we will believe, that we will obey, and that we trust. And, Lord, I pray blessings on your people. I pray you'd prosper in coming and going. Lord, I pray, God, that you'd open up doors that need to be opened, closed doors that need to be shut. Lord, for those that are lonely, I pray you'd comfort. For those that are sick, I pray you'd heal their bodies. Lord, for those that are in conflict, I pray that you'd bring the peace of God that passes all understanding. Lord, we accept your challenge of your word today. And Lord, we know that you're going to show yourself strong. So when we arrive at those Red Sea moments, we're going to forge ahead. Even before the waters part or the doors open, we're going to step out by faith in the name of Jesus. If you believe that today, why don't you give God a hand clap of praise? He's brought you through another year. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to tell you, I'm sorry I'm saying, hey, I just caught myself. I have a family member that every time they talk to me, they go, hey, 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 anybody? don't answer that. And so I was around that for three days to catch me to Mark Tuesday. I found myself preaching going, hey, hey, it's because I heard that for three days. That was the beginning of it. Hey, hey. I want you to know that I love you. You are important. You are needed. You are valuable. You are part of the Connection Point Church of God. I want you to be part of the family of God. So stick in here. Don't quit. Don't leave. Don't let discouragement or depression get you. are needed. Have a wonderful rest of the day. See you Wednesday. Hot fresh meals, small groups. If you need me, call me. Happy New Year.